All right. Well, we are in the middle of a discussion, um, and we're going through, we're, we're in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. We worked through chapter 11 this past week and covered basically the story of what narrative, what, what, what is it that we talked about? All right, David and Bathsheba. So that was the, uh, basically the story that we talked about. We went through um, all of this. And, and keep in mind all of the things that Nathan, I'm sorry, not Nathan, that David does in this story. Um, let's, let's just make a list. What are the things that David does? Go ahead. What is... Okay, all right, so, um, yeah. Okay, what else? We're looking for the negative things. It shouldn't be this hard to come up with some. Okay, so, lost. Followed by, you know what, I'm not even, I'm not going to put those as two on the same. All right. Yeah, there we go. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, Bev? My Bible says that those messengers took Bathsheba. I think he used his power to take her when she would not have gone, maybe as an invitation. Okay. All right. So I... Well, okay. Yeah, adult nap. Yeah. Um, I'm not going, I don't want to argue against it because I think the point is there and it's valid. Um, I'm trying to think though, abuse, let me say he abused his position of power. Is that a fair way to say that? Um, okay, Sue. Deceit. Deceit, yes. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, but I do want to, because this is... I want to maintain this that Bev brought up, that he took her. So, and I think that there is something to that. Um, but yeah. He made others complicit in his wrongdoings, not just Joab, but the messengers and others as well. I mean, this is, it's a pretty bad laundry list, isn't it? What, what's that? Okay. Although that is a passive type of a thing. You know, I mean, the, and we'll, we'll talk about that child um, tonight. That would be coupled, I think, with the idea of adultery. That's the pro byproduct or the result of the adultery uh, that is committed. Um, at the end of chapter 11, before the very last sentence, strike out the very last sentence, um, what does it look like for David? It kind of looks like he got away with it, doesn't it? Does, is anybody the wiser? 
Definitely some people are. Some people know. But by and large, the further that you get away from David, the further that you, you go outwards, you mean, obviously the messengers know, right? Probably, who knows? Well, Bathsheba definitely knows, yes. Uh, yeah. All right, all, all the servants, Uriah, I'm, you know, I, would, I make the case Uriah knew exactly what had happened, and, and he's kind of confronting David about it in his uh, discussion. Also, what name did we bring up last week? Uh, actually, starts with an A, but close. Ahithophel. Uh, and so Ahithophel, one of David's counselors, yeah, uh, one of the wise men, is going to betray David um, in just a couple chapters you know, down the line. So it seems like he probably knew in relation to Bathsheba. So... It's not like nobody knows, but by and large, once you get out of the, the closest circles around David, are people really the wiser? It kind of looks like he got away with it. And in his mind, he probably feels like he got away with it. What's the problem? Yeah, that very last sentence there that uh, the narrator... You know, the narrator, he's, he's the one that likes to throw in these little sentences here and there and uh, make sure that you, as the reader, are kept up to speed and you can read between lines, although you don't really need to read between too many lines on this one. What does he say? How, how, does, how does chapter 11 end? Yeah, 2 Samuel chapter 11, the very last phrase of chapter 11 the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And if you're reading through this, um, these things that David do, uh, all of these things that, that, that he does through this, are you pleased with it as the reader? Do you feel by the time that you get to here as if David's got what's coming to him? No. No. You don't at all. You read through and you're like, well, that's not right. Oh, well, that's certainly not right. Well, he shouldn't have. Are you kidding me right now? What? You, you, no. No. Oh, please. No, you didn't just do that, David. No. And then you get to the end and it looks like everything's fine. You are displeased with David. And the narrator's letting you know you're not alone. You're not supposed to be pleased. You are supposed to be displeased with David right now because you think the way that the Lord thinks. And so as you're reading through this narrative and you get to the point where he says, this thing displeased the Lord, you're like, well, yeah, of course it does. It absolutely does. Could this have gone without saying? No. Well, it could have. He didn't necessarily need to say that so that you would understand it. But he does say it, and, and I think Josh, you know, is absolutely right that this needs to come out because as the reader, you need to absolutely know God is watching, God's going to take care of this. And this transitions you now into the Lord's response. Chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city. The one rich and the other poor, the rich man, had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel, drink from his cup, lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. So he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Verse 5, then David's anger was greatly kindled. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, that man deserves to die for what he has done. 
and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he what? Because he had no pity. Now, why does Nathan come to David with this story? Okay. The Lord sends him um, to, to come and, and to talk to him. Uh, I guess let me rephrase that. If you're David, what is Nathan doing right now? Okay, we know that it sets him up, but yeah, Kelly. The, the king in that time served as the, uh, like the chief judge. Yeah. So he's got when his trusted advisor bringing this case to him, and he gets outraged by it. Um, but he doesn't see it coming. He thinks Nathan's just saying, hey, this, this is a situation we got to deal with. Yeah, yeah, I really think for David, he's, uh, he is an arbiter. I mean, remember one of Solomon's great stories? It has to do with the two women and the baby. That's one of the roles that a king plays, and he has to be the one who judges between individuals. And so Nathan comes up and says, all right, here's... Here's a crazy one that you might want to hear. And he tells the story, and, and we know the story, right? Do we need to really go through the depths of, of this? You, know, you have the wealthy man who's taking advantage of the poor man. And uh, tell me, though, about the relationship with this poor man and his, uh, his uh, sheep. All right, was like a daughter to him. That's an interesting word. Why? Why like a daughter? Because what? Because it was a girl lamb? Okay, very good. But that's a choice that Nathan makes, is to make it a, a you lamb, right? To make it a girl. Why? Kelly? Um, we're, I don't know about Jewish culture, but in American culture, we're extra protective of girls. Okay. Uh, and so that's a special relationship. Plus, too, I wonder how much he's tugging on David's heartstrings as a, as a boyhood shepherd that this is happening. Oh, yeah, we'll definitely get that in, in just a minute, you know, uh, the, that, that connection. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there could very well be the idea involved uh, with being more protective towards females, uh, especially daughters, as the case might be. Um, we'll come back to that in just a second. Let, let's go to what, they, uh, to what Kelly was saying um, about his history. We know that David used to be a what? Shepherd. What did David think about the life of, of his sheep? What value did they have? Higher what? Higher than his own. Remember uh, when we talked about the Goliath narrative? And what did he tell Saul that he had done? Yes, killed the lion and the bear with his bare hands. Yeah, Sean wanted to make sure everybody caught that uh, that unintentional pun there. Yeah, so he, I mean, he, he goes out, he's willing to risk his own life to save a single lamb from the lion, from the bear, and, and he attacks both of those. Um, so when he comes, and, you know, and he says to Nathan, uh, Nathan, I, I think Kelly's right, tugging on the proper heartstrings, Nathan knows where the story has to go to get the response that he wants. Let's bring up sheep. If there's one thing that David knows and understands, it's the relationship between the owner of the sheep and the sheep themselves. And so he brings up this story and gets them. What, what's David's response? He deserves to die, so why doesn't he sentence him to execution? Kelly? It, 
he doesn't deserve to die. That, that's an odd one to me. Like, he's just outraged, but there was nothing under the law of Moses about killing somebody for stealing a sheep and eating it. Like, I, I've always kind of wondered, like, why that, like, like, he went over the top on his response. All right. Anybody else want to counter Kelly's statement? Okay. All right. So we'll talk about that um, in just a second. And um, he said that you get the emotional response as to what David is thinking, and then the rest of it is the legal response. Uh, Josie? Yes. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. He says he deserves to die, so why doesn't he sentence him to death? Josie said that the phrase is he deserves to die, not that he will. So why doesn't he sentence him to death? This one's not really a trick question. Sean said it a couple minutes ago. Kelly mentioned it earlier. No. What does the law say about a lamb that, or an animal that is killed? What does the law say? What's restitution? Man, what is going on tonight, guys? What's the sentence that he gives? All right, fourfold restitution, right? He says, we're going to do it according to the utmost of the law. You know, but this is, this is legally what he has to do, is what he's saying. And he's going to pay every cent that he has to pay, but David says, I guarantee you, though, he's getting off easy. Because to that man, and this goes to, to Kelly's conundrum earlier, which I kind of get, but then I think Kelly's kind of way off, too, on that. Uh, he smiled at me for you folks at home, just so you know. That, that wasn't me, you know, be, be littling him. Uh, you know, what is the relationship that David understands between this poor man and that lamb? Is it just another lamb according to the law? What's the relationship between that poor man and his lamb? It's like a daughter. What is a daughter? Is that a lamb? Is a daughter, can you equate a daughter with a lamb? Yeah, this, this isn't just another lamb that you have out there to have, you know, lamb chops or something like that. This is a member of the family, and David gets it. David understands that. He understands what it means for this lamb to eat and to drink from the table, to, to be a part of the family. This isn't just any lamb. This is a member of the family. And you can create that kind of relationship with your animal that to the neighbor, the, the, rich, the rich man, yeah, it was just another commodity. To this poor man, this was everything to him. This was a daughter. It's not just another lamb. No, a, a lamb is, is, you know, you kill someone's lamb, that's not worthy of death. But if someone kills your daughter, do they deserve to die according to the law? Do you want them dead? according to the law? No. You kind of do, right? I mean, that, that's the idea. This is what is deserved, and David says, that's the way that this situation is. He deserves this, because that was like a daughter. But, we're going to do the full extent of the law. By the way, another reason why maybe daughter is, is used. Is anybody by any chance, and if you don't, no big deal, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm just throwing this out here to gauge before I say it. Does anybody know what the Hebrew word 
for daughter is? It's bat or bath. Does that have anything to do with David's scenario? Bath, finish it. Bath, Bath Sheba, which name means the daughter of the promise, the daughter of the, it's not, I mean, it's not the word for covenant, but, you know, that type of an idea. Um, you know, in other words, there's a direct hearing, audible connection between the word daughter and Bathsheba, or Bathsheba, you know, is probably how it's pronounced. So Bathsheba. I, I think that's there for a reason. I, I think that you're supposed to kind of catch that little play, that word play that's going there, that, yeah, this is going to turn on David. Um, and so David is uh, furious. His anger is greatly kindled. He declares this person should die, but we should give the full restitution of the law, right? Whatever the law says, we're going to take it to its absolute max. He will pay every penny of what is owed. And then you have the classic line that says what? Hmm? All right. You are the man. So there at verse 7, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And, and if this were too little, I would add to you so much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he will lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. You did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord the child, who is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house. All right, so we have a few things to unpack through all of this. Uh, you have the classic line, you are the man. Um, and obviously, we now see that this is not a real case that's taking place somewhere. Uh, this is a parable of sorts to be a metaphor for what David has done. Um, is it a straight one-to-one -one metaphor? Do you know what I mean by that? Like, can you read what Nathan said and say, oh yeah, well that's obviously what David did in the earlier chapter? No. No. You know, and it's important that we realize that, that that's the way that things are often presented. Uh, in metaphor, um, you know, imagery, symbolic imagery, things like that. You have stuff that's a kind of generally somewhat close, and the minute that you start trying to connect, like with a lot of prophecy, future prophecy, and, and you have this long list of things, and you say, well, you know, let's go item by item by item. Every one of these things, I have to be able to equate to something over here, somewhere. Well, that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes it's just getting a general picture that's painted in one place, 
and then the general picture comes true somewhere else, even if it's not a direct correlation point by point. Does that make sense? So that's what's happening here with this, this picture, this metaphor that's being used. Um, what are the things that now David is told uh, is going to happen? What's that? All right, well, let's start not with the last one that he says. <laughs> let's, let, let's start off earlier, and we'll work our way to that one so that I may run out of time before I have to cover it. Um, Okay, so another list here. We'll start. The sword will never leave your house. That's an interesting word to use, house. Have we heard that word before? With David? Yeah, where? Okay, yep, David came to God, said, I want to build your house. God said, well, no, you're not the one that's going to build my house. You're going to prepare the way for the building of my house. But because you wanted to, I will build your house. Um, and, and so there's already this sense that God is establishing David's house. And now he says there will be war in your house. Um, now, you can take this one of two ways or both. It could very well simply be talking about his own household, right? That he will have warfare in his own household. Is that possible? Is it going to happen? Yes. Yeah, we know that that's going to take place. On top of that, what about his household extending through the generations? the house that God said would be an enduring house that would go through the generations that God may have told him or may have planned that he would have peace through all of the generations. Does the house of David simply have peace through all generations? No, the sword does not depart from the house of David. And it continues on uh, all the way through. Yeah. I know that Solomon's reign was fairly peaceful, but did, they were, he was, David was supposed to be out fighting the Ammonites, mm -hmm. and he didn't. Did, I'm wondering if they, I just, I don't, I'm wondering, did the Ammonites like never get defeated? And so they constantly like, are they, are they, a, are they a thorn in the side, or, or is it other groups that are a thorn in the side of, of, the, of they, the people? They do get defeated. Yeah, you know, in, in this, he, that's where he's supposed to be, but Joab is doing the job for him. And then once this narrative, in fact, at the end of this narrative, Joab's going to say, look, if you don't get over here, I'm the one that's going to take the capital and I'm going to get the credit for it. So you may want to get off your rear end and get out here, you know, is kind of what Joab is, seems to be telling him. Um, you know, and that's Joab. Remember again, who, did he obey David's orders? No. He seems to be the one that's like, you know what, I'm going to do my own thing here, and I think I've got a better grasp of this, and uh, you know, it, we're going to see it later with the whole Absalom thing. He's the one that kind of shakes David by the shoulders to try to talk some sense into him. Uh, and so that, that's kind of the role that he has a tendency to play. All right, so the sword, whether it be in his immediate family, which we just talked, just mentioned, Absalom and, and everything that's going to take place, or in through the generations of his children, they will always continue to still have battles that they will fight with their enemies around them, and sometimes battles against each other. Um, all right, very good. So what else? Okay, uh, and so you have then, from your own house, which could be the sword from his own house, and, and I think we see this, all of this kind of play out with Absalom. Um, he says, 
I will take your wives and give them to your neighbor. So your wives, those attached to you, will be given to your neighbor, and he will kind of, well, I guess what it says, he will lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. He says, you tried to do all of this secretly, but I know, and I will make sure that what happens against you is going to be seen by everybody. Um, and then finally, Jason, what was the last one that he said? All right. Your son that was born will die. And that comes directly after he says what? Which is a real head scratcher. Yeah. David, David confesses. David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says, okay, that's good. The Lord has put away your sin. You are forgiven. Therefore, what? You will not die. But because the deed you have done utterly scorned the Lord, the child who was born to you will die. And then Nathan went to his house. Now, this one's going to be an interesting conversation. Um, first and foremost, I said this back when we were talking about Saul and the Amalekites. Um, and, you know, remember the, uh, the whole discussion that we had on, uh, what was it, Nacham, um, to utterly destroy um, you know, the, the Amalekites and, you know, women, children, everything else. Uh, we do not want to change what the Word of God says in order to make it more palatable to us. Does that make sense? It is what it says. Um, you know, and I said that because I did take a different approach to what Utterly Destroy is, and we had a good conversation about it. Some of y'all may have bought it, and, you know, and you're like, yeah, that makes some sense. Some of y'all maybe chewed on it, didn't like the flavor, spat it out, that's fine. Um, but I, I wanted to make sure that you understood, I'm not trying to find a way of understanding this that is more amenable to me or anybody else. The text is what the text is. God is who God is, and we need to be very careful. You know, I've had conversations with people who said, well, I can't accept this or that because my God that I serve would never X, Y, or Z. At which case, what are we doing? Okay, making an idol. We are... We are creating the God we serve at that point, right? If we say, well, the God that I serve is, you know, would, would do this or would not do this, therefore I can, you know, accept or reject what's here, we become the ones who dictate who and what God is. And we begin to create God in our image of what we find acceptable or unacceptable. I say all of that because this conversation is a very difficult conversation for us, I think. I should say it should be a difficult conversation um, because what's wrong with this? So why does the son have to bear the consequences of the father's actions? All right. Why does the son bear the consequences of the father's actions? In other words, it's not what? It's not fair. It's not fair to that child. If we say that God is first and foremost 
just, is this justice? What do y'all think? Kelly? It's not fair that David would get to enjoy a son from that union. Okay. It wasn't his son to make at that point. And I don't know if God had plans for... Well, I know God had plans. <laughs> what, what God... What, God has plans later for David and Bathsheba's kids. Yeah, we'll, but, but, we won't but, mention that yet. But not this one. This is, this is not the son of promise. This is the son of sin. Okay. All right. Anybody else have a thought? Yeah, Cliff. Hold on one second. The microphone is on its way. All right. In a way, I think it's David who actually um, caused the destruction of his son because God, um, you know, it tells us that um, he caused his enemies to blaspheme. And I think that maybe that might have something to do with that. Okay. All right. In what ways, Cliff, would this cause his enemies to blaspheme? No, exactly, except that he would be against God, blaspheming against God, I suppose. Um, they were probably, most of them, his enemies were doing that anyway, but, okay. but still there were probably some that, that um, may have gravitated, who knows, towards God. But this kind of an incident would, would show them something about um, God because of the way that David conducted himself through this. Okay. All right. Yeah. Mike is almost there. No, that's Kelly. Is this one of those prescriptive versus descriptive punishment kind of things? Okay. Um, I don't know if we have enough information to see how this is descriptive. Um, you know, if for some reason we knew that this caused some kind of illness upon the child in, in particular, then, you know, the Lord could be like, yeah, this is your fault. It seems, it seems prescriptive. That's a really good question, though. Uh, I, I, like, I like the fact that you're, you know, expanding and bringing that up, that, yeah, that, that could be in play. Um, right behind you. Yeah. It's making me think about how the children of Israel were where the world was to see God through. And mm -hmm. so now they're looking through and seeing what David has done, and that causes them to, to wonder. Yeah. So going back to what Cliff was saying about make, allowing the enemies um, to blaspheme to some degree, who are the enemies? Okay, the Ammonites, but the Ammonites are about to be put away, right? Who's the next big enemy? Well, David's kind of his own worst enemy here. Who's his next big enemy? His son, right? And the people surrounding his son. And people who join his son's rebellion, such as whom? Yeah, very good. The, as Isaac said a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I hit the foul, right? People that did seem to know what had taken place. And this had caused them to turn against the Lord's anointed and to cause this kind of behavior. There were people who knew, and they became the enemies of David even internally. This isn't just an enemies out and about. These are all the people who are turning against David. Um, so we, we come back, though, to, to this idea. 
And, and this one should, I, I think it should bother us to see the innocent whose life is taken because of what the Father has done. Um, at the same time, I think a lot of that, at least this is where I'm sitting right now, it's right here on the stool, um, where, where I am right now in this, it could change 10 years from now, my thoughts on this narrative and what's taking place here. But here, here's where I'm at at the moment. Um, this statement comes directly after God told David what? You won't die and... All right, your sin is taken away. So what do you have taking place here? Sins are forgiven. He will not receive the just punishment. Instead, what? Instead, there is an innocent son whose death allows for this. Yeah, Dale? I, th this list, one through four, this is going to sound odd. Oh, well, then don't say it. But no, I'm kidding. That's the mercy of God. Mm -hmm. He's dealing with David. He's not dealing with the son. Mm -hmm. This is his actions toward what David has done. Now, I, it's to, to call that child's life insignificant is not... Is, doesn't seem right. It is significant, it, but uh, even in this uh, narrative, to use your word, um, could have been much worse for David. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I say this is the mercy of God uh, in action. Yeah, I, I think so. Um. Let, let, me follow, let me follow the thread that I, I was putting earlier. Have we ever seen any narratives that involved the death of a son? Yeah, does someone have a hand up? Sorry, I missed it. Oh, I just said Jesus. Said okay, well, you just jumped to the, the, the end result right there off the bat. Yeah. I did, yes. Um, let me throw, what's that? Okay, all right, you didn't hear Samuel probably. He just said, what about Abraham and Isaac? How does that story play out? We've talked about it before, right? Does Abraham kill his son? Yes, Abraham kills his son in his own mind, in the way that he understood it, right? That's, that's the whole point of this. He went a three days journey in his mind knowing that his son was going to die. Now, he fully believed that what was going to happen on the flip side of, of his death? Yeah, he'd be raised again because this is the child of promise, right? Hebrews author tells us that in chapter 11. But he fully goes into it. In his mind, he has killed his son, which, by the way, that whole narrative comes off of a few various narratives in which Abraham's not a very good guy in those stories. He does things like what David is doing here, forcing himself on a female servant, Sarah's, female servant, having a child with that female servant, and then taking that child and casting it out, forcing them to go out to live on their own, even to the point where Hagar's like, this is it, I'm just going to let my child here and, and watch him die because I can't take care of him. That's on Abraham, all of that that took place. And then Abraham is finally given that child a promise, right? I mean, it, 
I'm not in the, the right chronolo chronological order. He does that and then he kicks Isaac, uh, I'm sorry, Ishmael and Hagar out. Um, and then God says, all right, take that son and go kill him. You know, there's something there with this whole picture. Now, we know the end of the story. He doesn't actually uh, take the knife and slay his child. There is a substitution that's there. But that story involves uh, the same principle. What about the beginning of the Exodus? Yeah, the death of the firstborn throughout the land of Egypt, particularly whose? The Pharaoh's. Why? Because of what Pharaoh's son did? No, it's because of Pharaoh's hardened heart throughout all of it. And by the way, did we have this discussion when it was Pharaoh and his son? We just kind of accepted it. Like, well, yeah, it makes sense. He did that against God's firstborn, so God does this against his firstborn. Turn around, turnabout's fair play, right? And then we moved on with our discussion. We didn't stop because Pharaoh's the bad guy. He, he's, he's on the other side. Of course we're not going to worry about him. He deserved it because he's the Pharaoh who caused all of these bad things to happen and chased down Israel and tried to kill him and all that other stuff. So of course... It's fine there, but it's the same scenario. The innocent child pays for what it is that the father has done. Um, Josie? Okay. All right, Josie says that this sounds, she's a little uneasy with this because this sounds an awful lot like child sacrifice, which God is clearly against child sacrifice. Can we all agree? God is clearly against child sacrifice. Yes. All right? Undoubtedly, absolute, hard, fast, and then he still told Abraham to do it. You, you have to put these together. Again, we can't change the text to make it sound better to us, but he is very clearly against child sacrifice that's a part of worship of these other deities that are out there, the way that they do it, and what it means for them, uh, and, and the freely, it's the free decision of the father to say, I'm going to do this to my child, which is, I think, I'm just to, to answer the child sacrifice response, I think that's a little bit different from um, these instances. Uh, Dale, did you have something you were? Yeah. All right. Kelly's working his way over there. And while he is, Josie, that's exactly my same thought. You know, I, I know I'm answering it, but I, I come to the same, uh, the same problem there. The, the real pain in that is to the father, mm -hmm. not the son. I don't, and there again, I don't need to belittle the life of the son, but the action is towards David. We, uh, we can sin and be forgiven but we still are going to face consequences of our sin. We know that to be true in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see going on here. To answer the question about why did he do that to the son, I, I can't answer that. But I, 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 I guess the way I look at it in my mind, that action is towards David, not the son. Yeah, it absolutely is towards David. Um, and the consequences fall on David, and, and the, the grief and everything falls on David. Um, 
And whom? Bathsheba. Um, you know, I mean, because that'll come out here. We're, run, we're quickly running out of time. Um, going to what Cliff said earlier, is this not exactly what's played out with Jesus? That you have the death of that son, and because of the death of that son, forgiveness is available. And the death of that son is a perfect innocent, blameless son, son, who's also compared to a what? A lamb. Um, and so I, I think there are hints of that. There, there are these, these little echoes that, that come back from what happens at the cross that you see sprinkled in all of these various stories. And, and in this one, you have this picture. Is it a one-to-one -one direct comparison? No, of course not. Is this child able to take away the sins of the many? No, of course not. It's just something that's played out. Um, and, you know, again, we're, we're quickly running out of time here. Um, man, there's, there's different things that I, I would have at least brought out for discussion. The seventh day the baby died, what is that? there any connection to the seventh day um, you know the the response of David when he finds out that the child is dead they expect him to what yeah they expect him to go ballistic instead what does he do yeah he accepts it and he goes and he worships what does that tell you David's response, what does that tell you about his mindset towards this? In, to him, in his day, his time, his culture, his way of doing things, and, and, and all of that for him, he says, yeah, this makes sense. He doesn't argue. He doesn't say, come on, God, that's not fair. You know, you, you don't see any of that. For him, he says, okay. This makes sense. This is fair as far as I, in approximately 1000 BC Hebrew or ancient Israelite culture over there in, in the land of Israel, and, and there, whatever, to him, it makes sense. And I think we have to allow for that. Now, the real, all of this really leads up to, and the last thing that, 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 we'll, that I'll bring out, there's, there's other stuff that's really cool through here, but um, verse 24, David comforted his wife Bathsheba. He went in to her, slept with her, and she gave birth to a what? All right, and named him Solomon. The story of David and Bathsheba is really the Solomon origin story. When you see Solomon, he is going to be forever tied to the David and Bathsheba narrative. All of this is put into play to introduce you to the next king. And when we get to the next king and we start talking about Solomon, all of this is going, or is supposed to be, kind of have the David and Bathsheba narrative there in the background. All right, um, we're out of time. From here, next week, um, we're going to look at the rebellion that takes place uh, in David's house. And, um, you know, we'll move a little more quickly through that and uh, may get ourselves into Solomon's reign. All right, thanks a lot, guys.